So, good morning, everybody. Um, and thank you, Nanny, for this nice introduction and for inviting me to this beautiful city of Zurich on the first spring day to talk about, well, the changing world of uh, science and technology. And my talk will be structured as follows. First of all, I'll talk about the big changes occurring in our world today and the challenges related to that. In the second point, <coughs> I will look at the nano and terra technologies to cope with these challenges. And finally, I want to sort of address the question whether we are living or at, on the verge of a new renaissance. Now, if we look first at the changing world of shines and technology, when we look at the 19th and 20th century, we see an explosion in physical sciences going all the way from mechanics and in the end to quantum mechanics, after which we have discovered most of the laws of nature on which we are now, in fact, building technology. And this technology evolved actually from the macro scale of producing material goods to the information technology today on the micro scale. Of course, the progress in science really moved into the uh, life sciences after the discovery of the DNA. And that happened at the nanoscale. And when we look now at the 21st century, we see that all converging. We see, in fact, information technology <coughs> to converge with biotechnology and with nanotechnology and even energy technology. So we see a first convergence here of many different disciplines in engineering <coughs> and in science. And a second point of convergence here is convergence between science and technology itself. In fact, today, we're talking about no longer about technology or science, we are talking about techno science, which is now happening completely at the nanoscale. The other sort of evolution in science is a boom in neuroscience. So we will understand better how this machine works and then maybe get information for new compute architectures, finally making artificial intelligence maybe come true. So we have three main categories the uh, three main characteristics of this technology. One is convergence, the second is more intelligence, and the third one is building of highly complex systems. But also that is changing our industrial world. When we look at the 20th century, we see two industrial revolutions, one based on fossil fuels, the other one on electricity as an energy carrier. And of course, all of this led with a lot of manual labor and capital to the production of material goods and an explosion of human mobility. The big changes occurred at the end of the 20th century with the appearance of the computer chip, the discovery of DNA, and finally everything happening at the nanoscale. And so the third and the fourth revolutions in technology are now taking place. The first one is information and communication technology, as we are all knowing. And the, the, the fourth one, which is now really emerging very rapidly, is the one of nano, bio, and neurotechnology. Now, it's uh, also a change in the kind of products that we produce and the way we produce them. In fact, making uh, material goods is moving east and we will have to get all our added value out of brain labor and knowledge to create this added value in new smart system design and in fact that's what nanoterra, nanoterra is all about and that will give rise to actually personalization of services and goods it will create nano medicine a new form of medicine and in the most important thing may be that it provides a sustainable world because today we are consuming 25% <coughs> more than the earth can sustain. In fact, in the 20th century, we behaved as if everything was unlimited and now we are confronted with limited limits to resources. So we have to create a lot of technology to cope with these challenges. And this brings me, in fact, to the societal challenges of the 21st century. And I'm mentioning a few of them. Perhaps the most important one is that 
By 2050, we will be 9 billion people, so we'll have to double if in a business as usual scenario, the energy production, the water and food production in the world. A third point, which of course um, is happening, is the soaring cost of aging and healthcare. The third one is how do we keep our mobility safe and sustainable? And how do we manage the complexity of a globalizing world? Think about the financial crisis, but also think about energy distribution uh, in the future world. Finally, for the Western countries, it's going to be very important to maintain our prosperity in a flattening world because we have no longer the monopoly of technology and therefore the added value will have to come out of what I call social innovation. That means applying technology to solve these challenges of the future world. Now, talking about, I will talk about two of these issues. The first one is energy, and the second one is <coughs> healthcare. If we look at energy, we see that especially due to the growth of the emerging economies, we may expect that by 2050, the amount of energy that we need is about doubling. And of course, when you look at two things, first, there is the fact that fossil fuels are uh, becoming more or less scarce. Uh, we have for about 100 years oil and gas. We may have for 200 years coal. And in fact, uh, the, the production, the affordable production is peaking right now. Of course, when you look in addition to that at climate change, then you will have to restrict the use of fossil fuels below the red curve on the slide. And that means that we have a fossil deficit here that will have to be filled up with CO2 um, restricted uh, or neutral technologies such as uh, solar energy, wind energy, um, uh, hydro energy, biomass, and so on and so forth, and even maybe some nuclear energy. The question is, is this really possible? Because if you really make calculations, you come to the conclusion that if this needs to become true, we have to produce in the next 50 years, every day, the equivalent of one gigawatt installed power by the CO2 neutral technologies. If we look at the year 2010, only 25% of that was really realized. So it is also necessary to produce new technologies to save energy, otherwise we will be in trouble. Uh, in the transport, the building sector, and the manufacturing sector. So if you think there is no work for engineers, well, that's what we have to do. Now, in fact, many technologies, if we look at our field of nanotechnologies, are indeed sort of mitigating these problems. The first one is the, um, the solar power systems today are the, the photovoltaics is consuming about half the silicon production today in the world. In fact, it's a rapidly growing business. There is at the moment a little of oval production, but the cost reduction in photovoltaics will soon make it again a flourishing industry. But of course, when we use wind and solar energy, they are distributed sources of an intermittent um, uh, character, and therefore, Perhaps the biggest challenge is on a European and a geo scale is to develop smart grid technology. In a smart grid technology, the energy production and consumption will be controlled by the internet. So this may be the biggest control system that humanity will ever build because it has to be done on a, on a European or a larger scale. And of course that will develop or need a lot of progress in developing intelligent ICT systems. We will have in every house actually uh, smart meters installed to control your energy pro uh, consumption, and we need to develop indeed huge sensor networks that are completely reliable if we want to keep our energy production secure. On the other hand, it is projected that new LED and OLED uh, lighting will save us about 240 gigawatts of power by 2030. And of course, hybrid and plug-in 
electrical cars can save 30% of the fossil fuels by 2030, but also that will require a lot of nanotechnology to be developed. For example, to develop um, uh, cheap uh, uh, um, uh, fuel cells and new batteries and super magnets that will require uh, new materials. Last but not least, <coughs> our planes still need to fly. And therefore, there is some hope that synthetic biology will lead to the point that we can produce non-food uh, um, uh, biofuels in the future. So there is a lot of work to be done, and there is a characteristic that is really very crucial, as you will see in all technologies, that is, it is not a single technology that will do it here, but we need really a holistic convergence of hyper-complex, intelligent, um, and heterogeneous systems that require a lot of research in new materials, computer science, and electrical engineering, and so on and so forth. So it is not a single discipline that will solve the issues, but it is a complete merger of these technologies, and that will come back. We will need convergence of technologies. Talking about aging and healthcare, if we believe the demographers, then in 2025, the young people will be in Africa and in India. And another point is, of course, that in our developed countries, more than 30% of the population will be like me, over 60. And that means that we are entering the exponential tail of the growing healthcare costs as a function of age. Unfortunately, that's the case. When your car gets older, it needs to go more to the garage, right? So, in fact, it is predicted that in the coming 25 years, there is a doubling of lifestyle-related chronic diseases, and we have to do something about that, because <coughs> the healthcare cost in Europe is now about 10% of the gross domestic product, and it is doubling every 20, 40, 20 years if we are not doing anything to it. Another problem in healthcare is that there are dying, uh, drying out uh, pharma pipelines because the development of new medicines requires about 7 billion euros on average. So that's a lot of cost. And the question is, that's a big challenge for techno science in the future. And there it is expected that the convergence of these technologies will and hopefully lead to stopping, in fact, curative medicine and substitute it by um, predictive, preventive, and personalized nanomedicine. Of course, the question is, that up to this point, technology has only made healthcare more expensive. So will it become cheaper or will it be for the happy fuse? And that put us be to, be, uh, before two main challenges. The first one is, for us engineers, we have to develop technologies that are at the same time cheap, but on the other hand, reliable enough to um, uh, satisfy the requirements of um, healthcare and certainly privacy. The second challenge is that it requires a paradigm shift also in the medical world and in the pharma world. You know, if we go to more uh, preventive medicine, then the pharma industry has to change completely course. So what are the nanotechnologies or terra technologies that uh, are available to cope with these challenges? I will talk about two of them. The first one is the, uh, the evolvement towards intelligent ICT systems, and the second is to talk more about the convergence of these different technologies. If we look at the changing world of ICT, we see many things happening. The first is that in this century, we are evolving from a PC-centric world to a PDA-centric world, which is providing everywhere a broadband con connectivity uh, from any place and any time to anybody and to anything. So we are moving, actually, from a world of an internet of data to the internet of things. The other thing is, of course, everything becomes wireless. We are, we are now completely mobile. And of course, when in the past we had only local storage, we are now storing all our data and all our computing 
for a great deal in the cloud. Finally, information consumers have now also become information producers. We're all producers of information. And in fact, in the past, it was only a question of hard and software, but it will become in the future even a connection with wetware, as we will see in a minute. So what are the ICT technologies that are driving this? And most of us are aware of that. The first one, of course, is more and more. This will last for perhaps another 10 years to go to sub 10 nanometer technology. But the second one is the emerging more than more technologies that you find on the right. The more and more technology will provide us all with supercomputing in our pockets, supercomputing and supercommunication towards every information source and everybody in the world. But of course, smart sensors and actuators on which NanoTerra project is working both in the living world and in the non-living world will connect also our personal assistant with all things in our environment. And then, of course, another technology is polymer and flexible electronics that will provide us with extremely cheap RFID tags that are local, locality aware. Um, and, of course, uh, um, OLED displays of very large size electronics. We will also have flexible electronics, which is important in automotive and in the medical world. And last but not least, it was also mentioned by Nani, we will, of course, have 3D technology where in a few cubic millimeter, we will have intelligence or smart dust where information technology will disappear in the environment of people. And that brings me to this slide which I borrowed from Nokia where in the center there is more than a billion of these personal devices around that connect us, in fact, basically with, um, which is a mobile gateway to the social networks, to the cloud, but also to a myriad of smart things in our environment. It may be our car, it may be our home appliances, it may be the biosensors uh, measuring our um, cardiological parameters or smart refrigerators or even your toilet that is checking your health every day and making an alarm if something really goes wrong. So this is what people now call the uh, world of ambient intelligence where basically secure and reliable computing and communication is um, a present in visibly embedded in everything and in everybody and uh, it provides a pervasive and context-aware environment that is sensitive and responsive to the needs of people. This slide, which I borrowed from Philips, predicts that basically this ambient intelligence, and in fact it's already happening today, will be present in every aspect of our daily life, in the automotive world, in the elderly care, even in the creative industry, uh, in arts, in urban life, and in well-being of people. And that's a very important issue because ambient intelligence is really changing the way that we as people experience our environment. But that is also important in training engineers because in the past we need to develop technology and then distribute it over people. Now it's a bit different. We have to understand from the societal needs, what sort of technologies we have to develop. And in fact, Nanoterra is, is trying to do that. But it will require engineers to think in a very different way. It is to lift yourself into how people, how patients are reacting to things. How do they want to, to use technology? In fact, Steve Jobs is a very nice example of how to do that. And that will require Renaissance engineers, but I will also talk at the end about the need for Renaissance humanists. Now, all of this requires that these engineers are able to translate complexity into sense and simplicity. And that requires, in fact, the creation of living labs. They are now emerging. What is the concept of living labs? It is laboratories where you see user-driven innovation where all the relevant players in the value network are involved from the start. And that is extremely important because 
we have a lot of public and private research funding that there's great research in Europe, but a very little of that is really going into production. And that is what's called real innovation. So we need to cross the chasm. We need to cross the pre-commercial gap by building demonstrators of things that will be there 10 years from now in industry. And this requires an open innovation structure. And again, uh, NanoTerra is an example of that. And it's very important because otherwise we get stuck in Europe in the so-called European research paradox where we have excellent research but not enough products. Now, a few examples of that. First of all, there is ambient intelligence for aging care. Uh, this slide, which I borrowed from Intel, by the way, which is normally uh, well known for its microprocessors, is really considering very heavily development of healthcare technologies. And the reason for that, of course, is we're all getting older. We have money. If we have a problem, we are willing to pay for it. So we can develop <coughs> uh, all these IC or use this ICT technology for what we call in Europe ambient assisted living. And that means, for example, telemedicine, telecare, social contact interfaces, remote drug prescription, and uh, home robotics, and you name it. And in fact, I also see that in Nanoterra you have projects in that area. So telemedicine and telecare is going to become extremely important. If you are predicted to have a problem, you can have a very cheap, very low power um, wireless sensors, smart sensors in or on your body that continuously monitor your parameters and communicate them through your smartphone to the medical world that can then react to it if there is really a problem happening there. This is an extremely important technology. If you look at some predictions of growth of this technology, you can see basically that over a period of five years, there is a compound annual growth predicted for this technology of more than 100%. The most of it, it is uh, monitoring in the hospital environment, but also there is a big growth uh, in um, in-home health management and sports and fitness. So this is a rapidly growing business, uh, which will require a lot of semiconductor technology to be developed. Now, our mobility is also going uh, to, to drive a lot of the technology that is well known. The first one is if we go to electrical vehicles or uh, hybrid vehicles, they may look in the future, as you see on the slide, all the mechanical stuff will disappear. It's, I'm sorry for the mechanical engineers, but a lot of the controls will be drive-by-wire, just like in a plane, to reduce the weight. We will use new materials for a lightweight uh, bodies. And of course, 93% of all accidents happening on the road are not due to the car, but to the driver of the car. So we need to develop a lot of smart sensors that produce active safety in your car and in fact basically today a lot of that is happening. This car cocoon is now reality. If you buy a new expensive car still today, you have a lot of sensors and cameras in your car that prevent you from doing crazy things. So you will have adaptive cruise control, brake assist, collision avoidance, blind spot detection and you name it. I just bought a new car and if you pay enough money, all of that today is in there. What is not yet in there is the networked cars that communicate all with each other. So you'll have a huge system of cars that exchange information without you knowledging it, but also exchanging information with the traffic inf infrastructure to make the traffic as smooth as possible happening. And basically, in the end, your car may be an autonomous car. So you, you start and you say, I want to go from A to B, and the car will bring you there, and you can read your newspaper or whatever necessary. In fact, it is already happening, because if you look at Google Street View, most of the street views were produced by an autonomously driven car. Um, now, from a semiconductor standpoint, you have there three main layers. 
uh, or three technology shells that you really need. In the center, you need actually very expensive, very high supercomputer chips that provide you the infrastructural core, and most of that is connected by uh, optical fiber. But then the second shell around that is basically the mobile access layer where you have cheaper chips uh, that do all the computing for you locally and of course provide you wireless connectivity with the core. And then around that is a shell of maybe a trillion devices that contain very cheap sensors that create actually the ambient intelligence. And that leads to three types of chips that are very different in nature. The first one, of course, in the core infrastructure, you need supercomputers on a chip. They may cost you something like 100 euro. They dissipate about 100 watts, but for that, have to deliver about 10 tera ops of operation and are general purpose programmable. And that's really the more more driver. Then if you look at the uh, mobile gateway, the mobile access layer, you need a different kind of chips. They should cost less than 10 euros, deliver you something like 200 billion operations per second, but at a power which is less than 2 watts. So they are about 100 times more power efficient, or have to be, but of course than, than the uh, supercomputers in the servers. But on the other hand, <coughs> they have also to provide you or to be programmable with embedded software where you have a close connection between the physics of your processor and computer science. So even the computer scientist is no longer living in the heaven of hardware that is provided to him or her. Um, so this will require more, more, and more than more, for example, 3D uh, integration to couple memory into these processors. And finally, there is the sensor swarm, which is a real challenge that provides actually the wireless interface to the non-living and living world. And of course, that requires a lot of heterogeneous technology development and architectures, but now for less than 100 microwatts, you have to, and, and for less than one euro, you have to deliver ultra-low power sensing, computing, and perhaps uh, ultra-wideband radio for positioning things in the world. And that requires really uh, more than more technology. I will now first look at, you know, what will be the supercomputer of the world uh, in 2030 when we reach perhaps 0.3 volts, 10 nanometer technology. I made some sort of an extrapolation based on data from ISSEC up till today. And my conclusion was that by 2020, if we succeed, and I will comment on that in a minute, we will have the possibility of integrating 150 32 bit processors on a chip operating at 25 tera ops using one gigahertz clock and only dissipating five watts of power. That is seven femtojoules per bit operation. And if you compare that to the day's processors, that's about a hundred fold improvement in power efficiency. Now, what does the sentence mean if we succeed? And that is enormous because it means that in eight years time, when to evolve to 10 nanometer technology, we will have to substitute, for example, the now recent trigate uh, transistors by ultra low leakage transistors, which may be silicon germanium tunnel fits. We may have to substitute SRAM by resistive RAM. We will have to make ultra, um, extreme ultraviolet litho happening. We will have to come up with fault tolerant architectures because the, the chips will be full of, of uh, faults. <coughs> we will have to develop variability resilient design and most important the programmability issue of 150 processors on a chip will need to be solved how do you do the io maybe you need photonics so there is still an enormous effort to be done in the coming uh, eight to ten years and then of course there is what i call moore's anti-law that is the design cost 
This slide, which I borrowed from Renaissance and TSMC, gives the evolution of the design cost for new systems on a chip in the future. And of course, that's not only the hardware, it's also the software, the operating system, the applications, and so on. Well, they may cost something of a billion dollars or euro uh, in the future. And that is an enormous cost, which is perhaps the real software limit to more and more development. So what will scaling, uh, further scaling, be used for? Because of the soaring costs of development, I believe there will be only a few supercomputer platforms around and we will all use them. The second thing that drives actually this uh, scaling factor is solid state disks. Uh, when you buy an iPad, you, you have a solid state disk with flash memory that will explode. But in my opinion, the most interesting point is a myriad of possibilities to develop, to use these technologies in smart mobile systems and in smart sensors. Because if we extrapolate the compute power of the supercomputers to one millimeter square, you get the possibility to have 250 billion operations for 50 milliwatts of power, which makes your smartphone to become extremely smart. When I look at the sensor uh, swarm modes, Less than one millimeter square will develop you 250 million operations for about 50 microwatts of power, and that makes it possible to build extremely smart sensors that do not have to communicate too much with the environment because it takes too much energy. So that also changes, of course, the world of semiconductor industry because the scaling of CMOS delivers us, that's the good news, a lot more compute power and bandwidth, but on the other hand, the bad news is that the design and development costs also of technology are rising exponentially. And therefore, the only way out to do this or continue to do that is to share actually the development costs, both of design and process development in a few R&D consortia that are now also existing in the world, also exist in Europe, and then, of course, in the, in the future, I believe there will be only a very limited number of hyperscaling companies. Two of them, there are two types of them, or three types. The ones that will provide you the supercomputers, the one that will provide you the solid state disks. And finally, the third one is the um, advanced foundries in the East. And those are serving, actually, a majority of consumer-oriented semiconductor industries that we traditionally had in Europe that will become a lot more fab light or even fabless system chip providers to serve the ambient intelligent system companies. And of course, there is also a lot of more and more interfacing needed, uh, which is the development of CMOS or combining it with MEMS power electronics, 3D, bio, nano interfacing, and so on. And this is perhaps the most important message to Europe. I think most of these other hyperscaling companies will not be in Europe, but we in Europe will have to focus, in my opinion, on the two um, uh, types of industry that are at the bottom of the slide. And then, of course, more than more is a very interesting field to work in, and basically that's what uh, Nanoterra is also doing in my opinion, is the real art of ingenuity. It is combining virtually every trick in the book uh, to go to the ultimate limits of electronics, ultimate limits in miniaturization, ultra-low cost, ultra-low power, energy scavenging, and so on and so forth. And that, in fact, is a big challenge in engineering because every simple sensor node is, an, is a real jewel of system technology. It starts basically with a network protocol that needs to be developed on top, that's a system issue. It involves the development of ultra-low power, ultra-low volt voltage sensors and single conditioning and A to D conversion, microwatt level computing, ultra-wideband communication and location awareness, 
Power management, energy scavenging, packaging, even if you go into biocompatible packaging. So it is really multidisciplinarity in a few cubic millimeters of technology. And this is really going into a myriad of applications, uh, going from uh, automotive technology into healthcare instrumentation, communication, gaming, and personal devices. And you can see microfluidics, gas sensors, cell sensors, uh, even an electronic nose or a hyperspectral uh, micro camera. All of these are developed basically uh, using these nanotechnology and micro systems. My final point here is the convergence of these different technologies at the nano scale. I'll talk about two of these convergences. The first, <coughs> the first convergence is the convergence between biotech and nanoelectronics. If you look at the nanoscale, you see that all the biological um, building blocks from glucose to cancer cells are between 1 and 100,000 nanometers. Now think that actually a today's transistor or sensor on a chip is of the order of 100 nanometers or less. And so the question here is, can we make all these biological structures make communication to the electronics world? And the answer is yes, that's possible. And I'm giving you here one example that we are working on ourselves in IMEC, which is the uh, an, a NERF uh, project uh, which, uh, in which uh, the KU Leuven, the Flemish Institute of Bi Biotechnology and IMEC are involved. The idea is to make a communication between neurons and electronic systems. And what you see there at the bottom is a set of neurons and their axons communicating with transistor sensors below it. And uh, this is an in vitro system. It is going to be used for brain research. It is already being used at the hospital in uh, Leuven. And basically it's also used for drug testing because if you put drugs in there, you can study how the communication between the different neurons is happening with the actuating and the sensors that are below this. The second uh, part of this project is the development of neuroprobes, which are really intended to be put into the brain. So they are these uh, nice needles there that you put in your brain. They are more than needles. If you look at the picture there, they are needles that contain a lot of sensors and actuators in there that can be addressed like memory uh, places in, in a chip. And therefore, you can actually, by putting it in the brain, point to particular neurons to get fired or, in fact, uh, to be observed. This is important for all these uh, famous um, uh, brain diseases that you see on the slide. Uh, one of them you can see here is the development of needles that are actually in use today in the hospital to compensate for tremors in the Parkinson's disease. Today we are using, or uh, the, the medical world is using simple needles that are put in place. These are needles with uh, sensor places, as you see on the slide, which are addressable so that you can, without moving the needles, you can address the, um, the neurons uh, where it's actually needed in the brain. Now, a second sort of convergence is a convergence between biotechnology and nanotechnology. In fact, we know that we can engineer nanoparticles to contain, for example, uh, drugs like chemo drugs. And in fact, we can uh, put um, uh, antibodies to decorate them with antibodies, which are actually uh, fitting the antigens that are present, for example, in cancer cells. And in this way, we can bind or target, actually, the chemo no longer to the healthy cells, but to the cancer cells. And then when um, this Trojan horse, so to speak, is in the cancer cells, we can actually uh, use infrared uh, heating to release the drug inside. So this is targeted drug delivery. We can also use, of course, the nanotechnology to build new biosensors on chip. And then you see that everything here is converging. This uh, sort of 
um, drug delivery, nanotechnology-based drug delivery, is exploding very rapidly. Uh, you can see on the slide that over the last five years we have evolved to a $1 billion business, but it is predicted here that it will reach by 2021 136 billion dollars, which is half of the semiconductor industry um, business. So this nanomedicine is really exploding very rapidly uh, because you can see basically if you inject uh, a medicine here, it will target or home into the tumor and therefore it can lead to improved <coughs> imaging, localized therapy or even the killing of cancer cells. Another evolution that is going on very rapidly is uh, the development of molecular diagnostics at the point of care. So in the doctor's office, you will have a complete laboratory available on a micro scale. What you see here is a development that is taking place at a company called Biocartis. In fact, Rudy Powell's was an EPFLer many years ago. Uh, <coughs> so where you develop a biolab on chip in the middle, that can work from a number of uh, body, body, few, uh, body um, uh, liquids. And of course, it, it contains in that simple laboratory, in that micro uh, laboratory, all the necessary reagents to do a multi-parameter uh, biomarker evolution, which can be read in the doctor's office uh, directly. So it will hopefully reduce a lot of the cost in healthcare. Last but not least, there is the whole issue of genome testing. Uh, we all have a genome, which is about 3 billion base pairs. The cost is coming down at a rate which is much more rapid than Moore's law. And the hope is that by 2015, we will have the possibility for less than $100 to analyze your complete genome in a few hours' time uh, by combining all the the structures that we have been talking about, such as uh, nanostructures for um, picomol sensing, uh, massive parallel sensing architectures that combine basically semiconductor technology with photonics. And um, what happens if we have a $100 um, uh, genome testing system? Then we are very close to this picture of the American Institute of Nanotechnology for Cancer Prevention, which is basically we can start by taking every new person in the world is genome for a hundred dollars. After that, we know that he or she will be sensible about. Of course, I'm not sure you want to know about it, but if your doctor knows it, you can build in biosensors to monitor what is going to happen and use molecular diagnostics uh, at a very early stage. So this is predictive and preventive medicine. Then use bioinformatics to compute what the best medicine will be for you, because today this is not in a very good shape. And then we can, of course, apply this targeted drug delivery technology based on nanotechnology and finally follow up by using biosensors and telemedicine again. Now, this is clearly that a place where bio, nano and ICT are converging at all stages. And this is happening in many, many applications in the world, from automotive to healthcare uh, and so on and so forth. And then we can come to the question, do we approach here a new renaissance? Because in the renaissance, we had a combination of science, uh, hum humanity, and arts to create all sorts of new things by the sort of people that had a very multidisciplinary nature. Will we approach that? I believe yes, because what we are now seeing is that we are using our societal challenges to develop these ambient intelligence systems, and they will be using more more and more than more. But more more is a lot more than just nanotechnology. It is a combination with computer science linked to the physics of the devices. It may use uh, advances in neuroscience to come up with new architectures, and the same is true in the more than more where we need to combine neuroscience, nanotechnology, and life sciences to develop all the more than more sensors in the world. And therefore, I believe that progress, again, will 
be the merger of previously unconnected technocultures driven by societal needs. And that brings me to the point that our engineers of the future and our scientists will become Renaissance engineers. Will they become all Leonardo da Vinci's? No, because knowledge now is too large to become in one head. But certainly, it will be necessary to create team player skills, because you will have to work with medical doctors, with people that are completely out of your field. So it is absolutely necessary that we develop cross-disciplinary uh, communication skills that are trained in creative thinking no longer at their own field, but at a complete system level, and will have to cope with lifelong independent and interdependent learning skills and to cope up with the diversity of the world of change. So we have to tell the young people that there is a big future in engineering because the engineers are, in my opinion, the co-architects of future society that are, in fact, putting a societal vision into a solution. And of course, it has to have economic value. We need entrepreneurial spirit in our education and of course, we should be prepared to take part in the public debate. And therefore, there is a need in the education of engineers for what I would call sociology for future engineers, which we introduced actually in Leuven. But there is more than that. If we look at the philosophers that look at what we technical people are doing in the world, they say, well, there are two possibilities. Either we go to heaven, and the transhumanists like uh, Kurzweil would say that we go to a sort of a superman uh, based on, uh, you know, sort of intelligence of computers taking over, or we can go to hell by the creation of a brave new world which is going to self-destruct us. Fortunately, there are constructive people like Joel Garot who says, no, 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 we have to prevail which means that we, as technical people, should not, be, should not be driven by short time market considerations, but by long term desirable societal goals. But then who decides about the long term societal goals? Unfortunately, there are short term thinking politicians and economists. And of course, they are educated by media and education, and I have nothing against social scientists, but there are very little engineers or few engineers, except in China, in the government driving our society. And therefore, there is a big need for techno-scientific literacy by these people. And therefore, it is our duty, in my opinion, to go for public outreach, which is something that after my retirement I'm trying to do. So therefore, it is in fact more than an engineer's business. We will need techno-scientific literacy for every citizen in our society. And that means politics, media, citizens, and certainly education. And in education, this is very important to happen, not only for engineers, but happening for social sciences, arts, and humanities. And therefore, Besides sociology for future engineers, in our universities it will be necessary to install, in my opinion, technoscience for future philosophers. And basically there is one very interesting course in that you can find on the web in Berkeley, which is a course taught by Professor Muller and is called, very ironically, Physics for Future Presidents. And I really recommend you to go to the website and check it, because this is what he says about that. I'm assuming, and this is probably true, that everyone in this class is going to be a leader someday, and his goal is to look beyond the newspaper and understand things in order to make wise decisions. And what he says further is, it's even more important for the politician who has to make rapid decisions that may have enormous consequences. Do I put down the switch of a nuclear power plant or not? Well, these decisions are not made in a very uh, uh, well thought way, in my opinion. And therefore, I think, why not at our universities? Now, I'm very proud to say that starting this year in Leuven, we have installed such a course, and I have been teaching there. It's fun to teach to these people. Uh, also young people, uh, I talked uh, just uh, before this talk uh, 
uh, again here about uh, the need to have techno-scientific literature starting very early in elementary school and in high school. Our students are not really in our educational system looking at the creative and societal aspects of technology, which is a good motivation for them to go into math and, and in science. Now this is the boring subjects, right? So what we are trying to do here in Leuven with uh, Roger van Overstraat and society is to create, in fact, <coughs> building blocks, helping them to build themselves little systems and have fun with it. Fun is, engineering is fun. We have to tell them about that. Are our universities ready for that? Well, today, in most universities, you have still walls between science engineering in a world of techno science, and certainly with social, in, social uh, sciences. Therefore, we have to take away these walls. Huh? Um, the other thing is we are still driven in the academic world by hyper-specialized publication fever where only a few people, perhaps the reviewers, read your paper. What you really need is cross-disciplinary research and education and uh, the funding of cross-disciplinary research as actually is happening here. Um, it is also important when we, ed when we train uh, engineering PhDs not so much for publications, but for innovation. That is technical leadership and entrepreneurial thinking. Now, since time is progressing, I think Nanotera, in my opinion, is an example of a, a, a way to create your Renaissance engineers, because just like in IMEC and Citrus and Leti and so on, we are trying to solve system issues by thematic addressing problems in the world or society. And in your case, you're addressing health, security, and environment. And what you're trying to do here is involve, not, is involve multidisciplinary research from different universities and combining it into building demonstrators. Building demonstrators is extremely important because it will enforce the engineers to think much broader than their little field of their PhD. Their PhD still is very important, but it has to fit in a complete system environment. And uh, in fact, this is important to overcome the European research paradox because it will create an economical and an ecological win-win mode with industry as you are uh, also trying to do here. So I want to conclude here that the, in the 21st century, we are actually uh, in front of enormous challenges in society. And it is certainly so that the converging technologies that are being developed can lead, in fact, to solutions if and only if they are driven by long-term leadership on a global scale, meaning you look at the global issues and solve them at the local level. However, that requires an urgent need on long-term thinking and action. And I believe certainly that the system that we have now with a shareholder system that is more like a, a casino, that is only worried about next quarter, is not going to solve these issues. And certainly politicians have a next election mentality so we'll have to work on that, even as engineers. Because if we do so, it can lead to a huge ecological and economical win-win opportunity. But we need for that Renaissance engineers, scientists, and humanists that are trained in cross-disciplinary research organization, social innovation, and this technical and scientific literacy is needed at all levels of education. So with that, I want to uh, finish this talk and uh, I think we should join forces on European and even on a world scale in solving these challenges as engineers we have a great job to do thank you very much thank you very much uh, Hugo for these uh, great presentations. We have the time for a couple of questions. Yeah. 
I, I would have a, a question about the focus that you put in your talk about the technologies that are required in our field. You have put, put much, much focus on how to develop biotechnologies connected with nano devices that will be in our bodies to basically repair them when something is broken. Uh, my point about that is that if, if you generate a lot of nano sensors that are in the bodies, there will be a huge amount of information that you will first have to put in models so that we can understand how to use them. And this is something that is difficult. While my feeling is that our body is in fact functioning quite well, what makes it go wrong is that we are exposed without even knowing it about a lot of pollutants mm -hmm, mm -hmm, in our sure. environment. Mm -hmm. So I think that it would, be, it would be also important to stress the point that all these sensors, nanotechnologies, et cetera, could and should also be used to basically provide explicitly to people information about what they are exposed to in their environment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you think, what do you think? Uh, I, yes, I agree with that. Um, I, in fact, I, I picked only a few <laughs> uh, sort of things. There is myriads of things. And of course, lifestyle, influences very much uh, the evolution of our body. You can see that on my belly. So um, yes, you're right. And in fact, basically a lot of that is being developed even for smartphones today to, to monitor your environment in which you are living. And even, you know, uh, so there is development of electronic noses to find out whether your food is correct or not. Uh, you have mirrors that look to you in the morning and say, well, you may, yesterday you had a good dinner, but today you have to change your attitude a little bit. So all of that is really indeed happening too, yes. Yeah. So first I have a remark that, uh, of course, if we um, introduce this um, intelligence system in our bodies, we'll have a, another level of symbiosis of human and technology. Of course, we now don't even notice how much uh, we are dependent on uh, internet and electricity. I have once survived uh, one week in the Alps without, uh, without current. It's a very strange experience. Mm -hmm. But uh, maybe another remark is uh, that we are talking normally about this uh, uh, systems doing this, that, and so on. Uh, and um, a bit like what my you know, predecessors spoke about things that may go wrong, this one thing, and then maybe the life cycle of, of these uh, systems, and then um, about the level of complexity. Mm -hmm. Because if we have um, something like the swarms of sensors or smart dust, and we have smart dust of one generation with version one, two, three, four, it may be sort of interaction that we did like, uh, you know, with introducing of uh, rabbits to Australia. <laughs> and then dogs that should kill the rabbits and then uh, viruses that should kill dogs. Uh, so we may be, uh, you know, fight of, uh, field of fighting of different versions of software in our bodies. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's true, uh, but that's, uh, I think the importance here is the concept of these uh, living labs where you are not only developing technology because you have fun developing technology, you have to develop technology with the user in mind. Uh, there are a few examples of that, but it would take a bit too long to discuss them where, you know, we have nice projects, like we have a nice project in Flanders on developing all this advanced technology, and on the other side you have small companies developing real technology for people in the field. And uh, there is quite a big discussion between these two, which is of the same nature as what you say. Um, but, but there is nothing that can stop you making these developments. And, and you're absolutely right. I'm personally very much worried, for example, about developments in synthetic biology where basically you can, you can synthesize viruses. Uh, we don't know what will happen with these viruses. You're absolutely right. But never until today you know, engineers and scientists have been stopped. And perhaps this is what Joel Garot means when he says we need to connect technology to society by connecting it to well-educated and long-term thinking politicians. But will that happen? I'm, I'm not sure about that. We'll take one last <laughs> 
it, feel, it seems to me that the current generation, the young people, they're primarily trained by video games and Facebook accounts. So do you think it's possible, or how do you motivate them to think about these longer term survival um, um, combination of the cultural and scientific thinking? It seems to me it's very difficult to touch them at this point, given what we provide them with this electronically in, uh, surrounded education mm. environment. It's a very tough question. <laughs> um, yeah, well, I think we have to look at young people as customers, right? And we have, we have n not to condemn them because, you know, they're hooked to whatever sort of games they play. But my experience is that young people are extremely interested in, in the future of society if you look at this whole issue of sustainability. So you have to sort of you catch them in education by introducing you know, and learning them what's happening in the world around them and to try to find simple, simple solutions around that. Think about, you know, how is it possible that I can drink the water out of the tap? Uh, and I think one of the issues here is make them do things. Eh? If they play games, they do something. But you can make them do other things. Eh? We, we make them build some sort of a, a simple intelligent train. It's amazing. They can build so, uh, fine estate machines if you, if you go with them on a summer camp. And they enjoy it because in the end, they have the joy of every engineer. In the end, it works. It should work. <laughs> I want to ask about the role of the region in the global world. And uh, Asia is something strong in the production right now, or the US may be strong in the internet services. I mean, Europe, what is that? So what do you think about the those are law, or we should have something law in the global world? Yeah. What do you think about it? <laughs> it's also a very tough question, um, I think. Well, my, my personal opinion is that, uh, you know, if you look in the East, there is a, a completely different attitude with respect to technology from here. That's why I experience. Um, I am personally uh, a bit worried about not only Europe, but uh, the Western, the traditional Western world where some of these technologies, uh, you know, sort of originated. And this is because the, the awareness of people, um, how important this technology is to, to, for their progress and where they should make the difference. It is a very tough question because, of course, it involves economical differences, social differences, and so on and so forth. And to be very honest, I am worried. Yeah. Well. I would like to thank you, Hugo, for a great presentation, really a visionary one.